can salvation be lost? What did the scriptures say? The following is a debate between me and a Calvinist who believed it was impossible to walk away from the Lord. Let's begin by defining some terms. Calvinism is a system of Christian interpretation initiated by John Calvin. It emphasizes predestination and salvation. The five points of Calvinism were developed in response to the Arminian position. Calvinism teaches total depravity. Man is touched by sin in all parts of his being, body, soul, mind, and emotions. Unconditional election. God's favor to man is completely by God's free choice and has nothing to do with man. It's completely undeserved by man and not based on anything God sees in man. <laughs> Limited atonement. That Christ did not bear the sins of every person that ever lived, but instead only bore the sins of those who were elected unto salvation. Irresistible grace. That God's call to someone for salvation cannot be resisted. And perseverance of the saints, that it is not possible for one to lose one's salvation. So, to recap, Calvinism believes in five basic tenets forming the acronym TULIP. Total depravity, in man there dwells no good thing. Unconditional election, since man is totally depraved, election is not based on any merit whatsoever other than the eternal counsel of the will of God. Limited atonement, Christ died only for the elect. Irresistible grace, every man who receives an effectual call by God's spirit to salvation will be saved. You cannot refuse God. Perseverance of the saints, those saved by the power of God are eternally secure and will remain in a righteous condition because of it. Now let's define Arminianism, the extent of the views of the late 16th century Dutch theologian Jacob Arminius. Arminius' views were somewhat more reformed than those of his successors. Arminianism generally holds that man is not totally depraved, that God chooses men to salvation on the basis of some foreseen faith or goodness in them, that Christ died in order to save every man, that God's grace can and will be resisted, and that Christians can forfeit their salvation. Arminian doctrine is the term for a theological stance originating with Jacob Arminius, a contemporary of John Calvin. His beliefs included conditional predestination, which basically states that God predestines those he knows ahead of time will accept him, whereas Calvinism taught an unconditional election. Free will of man, a teaching that says that man is a free moral agent and can actually choose God or reject God. Unlimited atonement, a teaching that Christ died for more than just the elect. Resistible grace, a teaching that says that since man is a free moral agent, if God calls him specifically to salvation, he can say no to God resistible grace. Forfeiture of salvation, which rejects the idea of eternal security. A belief that you must continue to abide in Christ, in faith, if you are to retain your saved state. Through sin, a person who was once saved can apostate and be damned. Now let's look at some scriptures from the Bible. Acts 13, 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing that you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Let me state up front, I do not totally embrace Calvinism or Arminianism. However, I do see some truth in both positions. Arguments used by those who believe once saved, always saved, and why they don't hold up to scripture. First of all, we saw what Paul and Barnabas had to say to these people, that they had rejected the offer. That shows the will of man involved there, uh, which goes against Calvinism. Now, arguments used by those once saved, always saved, 
and why they do not measure up to scripture. Point and counterpoint. My comments are in uh, bold letters. Calvinist. Remember, I'm having this debate. I had this debate with a Calvinist. To lose salvation, you'd have to abort yourself from the new birth. And he cites the Calvinist cited John chapter 3, verse 3 to 7. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not what I said to you that you must be born again. That which is born of the water and the spirit. Notice Jesus puts water first and then spirit second. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Referring to the water. Your mother's water breaks when you're physically born. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Speaking of being born again, of the Spirit of God. You've got to be born into the earth through a mother. Uh, today, people are born in test tubes, but that's, I think God makes allowance for that. The fact is, they conceive and come in through test tubes. It's, it's not happening very often. And then the second is the spiritual rebirth. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, this is the, arguments, the, Cal, the argument the Calvinists use. It says, to lose your salvation, you have to abort yourself from the new birth. These are the scriptures he's citing to me. And my answer is that these scriptures speak of the necessity of being born again. Jesus said, you want to be born again? This is what you need to do. And that the word of God is incorruptible and eternal, which First Peter says the word of God is incorruptible and eternal. It does not address the commandment for believers to be faithful. And we are commanded to be faithful. You know, on the day of judgment, Jesus is uh, <clears throat> listening to what people have to say. And there's a lot of people that come up to him, quite a few people, he, he said, Jesus said, that they're going to tell him, Say to him, look at all the things that we did in your name. In other words, aren't you impressed? Look how hard we worked. We did all these things in your name. And he doesn't even go there with them in his response. He simply says, I never knew you. Be gone from me, you workers of iniquity. Yeah, but didn't we do all this stuff in your name? Be gone from me, you workers of iniquity, into everlasting fire. I never knew you. What's going on here? Well, the Greek word hes, H-E-I-S, New Testament received text written in Greek, the Kone or common man's Greek, states that when Jesus is speaking uh, in front of some of the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sadducees, uh, the, and the hypocrites, uh, they hear him speaking and saying that uh, the Father and I are one. Uh, they ask him what's the greatest commandment. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There's one God, one Lord. And uh, you shall love him with all your heart and soul and mind. The second commandment, like unto the first, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says to them, The Father and I are one. And that blows their minds. They understand exactly what he's saying to them. He's saying that he's equal to God. They take up stones, rocks to kill him, to throw at him and kill him. And he says, for which of my father's uh, works, would, uh, righteous works, would you kill me? And they said, not for any righteous work of your father, but because you're just a man, but you put yourself on the level of God. You're declaring yourself equal to God or to be God because you said the father and I are one. They didn't get it. In fact, he said to them, he said, the reason you don't get it is because you don't belong to me. You're not one of the sheep of my pasture. You're not one of mine. That's why you're not getting it. Uh, and, he, and he told them. Uh, so the word hes, again, one, singular, not like a corporate group of one, but singular, one. So how can the Father and the Son be singularly one? The same spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's when Jesus is praying to the Father in the Gospel of John. 
and he says, Father, I pray that these uh, that you have given me uh, would be one, uh, even as you and I are one. And so someone says, well, that sounds like a corporate one, the body of Christ, billions of people, millions, billions, I think, billions. Uh, some people say less, but I believe there are billions of people at the, at the end will uh, wind up being saved. And it's the same word, hes. So if you're born of that same singular Holy Spirit, then you're one. So uh, Jesus said, uh, you will sit with me on my throne, even as I sit on the Father with his throne. Same Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit, born of that Spirit, and that oneness. So hence, you must be born again of that Spirit. And if you're born of that Spirit, you're in Christ you come into the Father's house. And if you're not, you don't come into the Father's house, which brings up an, an important, another important point. So I'll digress from this for just a moment, if I might. I've debated with a number of Jewish people who have said, look, uh, we have our Old Testament sacrifices. We, we applied them, uh, you know, burnt offerings, uh, evening oblations, uh, uh, offerings, sacrifices, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, that's that's how we get into heaven. And you can point the scripture out to them that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Uh, that the that the uh, you shall not drink the blood uh, of of any animal because that blood is uh, for a sacrifice on the altar. Now that's Old Testament uh, to pay for the, the sin of the soul of the soul that is sinned, the soul of the the person that is sinned. And they say, well, we've got our sacrifices, and we do things. Uh, I say, well, your temple's been gone for a couple of thousand years. How are you doing these things? Well, we make allowances for that. When you look in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, it says that this blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed was not just shed for the New Testament saints, but for the saints of the Old Testament, those who were called, those that God has chosen, that that blood was shed for them also to redeem them. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, whoever else gets in, uh, the prophets, uh, Moses, whatever, those people get into heaven, Old Testament saints, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the grace channel, that blood's applied to them also. Read Hebrews chapter 7 and chapter 9. Uh, so let's go on now. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. That just addresses the fact that the seed, the word of God is not corruptible. It says that if you're born of that seed, okay, so you're born of that seed, and that seed cannot corrupt. Can you walk away from God? It doesn't say you can, and it doesn't say you can't. Let's keep reading. A Calvinist says to me, to lose your salvation, you'd have to unseal your soul, return the Holy Spirit, and take them to hell. That's what that Calvinist said to me. But Ephesians 1, 12, 14, that we sh and he cites this, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom you also trusted, that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And he's citing that scripture to say, once saved, always saved. My response, this speaks of the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption, which is a future event. It does not address the command for believers to be faithful. For instance, New Testament, it's speaking of the holy angels, it says, are not they all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation in Christ Jesus. Future tense. Uh, right now we're being perfected. We're being clean. All our spots and blemishes uh, are being uh, withdrawn from us. And God's coming back for a faithful bride. And if he comes back and he sees a, a whore uh, that's sleeping with the world, there's rejection there. Did he reject you? Yeah because you rejected him. Uh, Jesus Christ is not a hell insurance policy. You shove in your back pocket and say, I'll see you when I see you. Doesn't work that way. It's not earned. It's a free gift. 
but you have to abide with the one that offers the salvation. What is salvation? It's being born again. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned against God, the Bible says he was well aware that he was wrong, uh, doing wrong. He, the gift that God had given him, his wife, Eve, uh, he valued the gift over the giver of the gift, which is God. And when he did that, he sinned against God uh, by taking of this tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, that Eve offered him. And uh, then he was aware that he was naked before God. He was naked. He was hiding in the bushes, not from his wife. The Bible says he was hiding from God. Uh, his nakedness, that glory that had been on him lifted. When that glory lifted, uh, he, he realized his nakedness before the Creator. And so uh, God made allowances. He, he made skins to cover himself because he couldn't cover his spirit at that time, his soul. So he put something on the outward body. Uh, uh, the, the, later, it would come through the rebirth that we could have our spirit rebirthed and our soul cleansed and our hearts cleansed. Uh, but uh, at the time of Adam, no, not so. So this speaks of the earnest of our inheritance and the redemption, which is a future event. It does not address the command for believers to be faithful. So what did we lose? What did we lose? Well, we lost uh, oneness with God. We lost oneness with God. So the separation from God. So Jesus says you have to be born again. If you're born of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God comes into you, you're born again. That's the gift. God is the gift. He's not offering you salvation as something else. He's offering himself to you. The way a husband would give himself to his wife and say to her, will you marry me? Will you be mine? And, and if the wife says, oh yeah, I will, but she spends all her time in the world uh, and, and could care less about the things of God, that there's no real salvation in that. Again, it's a gift. But if but are you going to receive the gift? Are you going to walk in the gift? Are you going to walk with God? If you're not walking with God, I'd stop and question my salvation. Now the Calvinist said to me, to lose salvation, you'd have to divorce yourself from the family of God. And quoting John 1.12, but as many as received him, he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So my response is, this speaks of the necessity of believing on his name. It, doesn't, it does not address the commandment for believers that we are to continue to abide in the faith, and the scripture says we're to continue to abide in the faith. But his response doesn't address that that you continue to abide in the faith. Calvinists, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. This speaks of redemption of those who were under the law, not of divorcing the family of God. Calvinists, to lose salvation, you would have to uncircumcise your heart, reattach your soul and flesh. And the, Cal uh, the Calvinists cited uh, Romans chapter 2, Colossians uh, chapter 2. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, uh, the outward circumcision of the flesh, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. In other words, it's not a series of deeds, do's and don'ts you do, Old Testament, do this, don't do that but it is rather uh, just accepting Christ, which is aside from or outside of or separate from observance of the law. If you're, the law was given to reveal man's sin and to rein man in, at least to some extent, because you feared what would happen to you if you broke the law. If you're born of Christ, that spirit of God, if you're walking with him, that spirit of Christ completely and perfectly fulfills all the requirements of the law that you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself because that's the Spirit of Christ leading you that's why the Bible says be filled with the Holy Spirit be being filled it says stay filled don't drift off stay filled if you drift off come on come on back don't stay drifting off keep yourself anchored rooted grounded settled uh, Colossians chapter 2, in whom also you, have, you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. 
Now this is the circumcision that Christ does in our hearts. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, the baptism symbolic of I'm under the water, I have died, I'm risen to newness of life, wherein you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. These scriptures speak of who the true Jews are and of the faith operation of God. It does not address the command for believers to continue to abide in the faith. Calvinists, to lose salvation you have to ungraft yourself from the olive tree. Romans 11, 11, he cites, this Calvinist cites to me, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now the olive tree is referring to Israel. Uh, for to provoke them to jealousy. The Gentiles are nations provoking Israel to jealousy. So my response to that is this. <clears throat> you need to examine the rest of that passage. Let's read further, beginning with verse 17. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches, but if against Israel. But if you boast, then uh, bear not the root, but the root bear you. Remember, it's, it's the root bearing you, not you bearing the root. Think about how a tree works. The root comes up and then the branches are born by the root, by the stalk. Uh, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also do not spare, does not spare you. Behold, therefore, the goodness and, sever and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward you goodness, that you continue. See that word continue? That you continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall be cut off. The Jews rejected Christ. They were all wrapped up in, in law observance, and when Christ came, the majority of people just rejected him. Uh, we have to obey the law. We have to do this and that. And Christ says, no, I'm, I'm the fulfillment. I'm your Sabbath rest. Believe on me. Most people rejected him. <clears throat> but you have to abide in Christ. Calvinists, to lose salvation, you'd have to amputate yourself from the body of Christ. Citing uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Also see uh, verses 12, 18, and 27. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. I was telling you about that earlier. By one spirit we are all baptized into one body. The body of Christ. So my response is, this speaks of all, Greek and Jew. There's neither bond or free, Greek nor Jew, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ. Being baptized into one body. It does not address the command for believers to continue to abide in the faith. Calvinist, sin. How many sins would it take to lose salvation? One. Revelation 21, 27, there shall no wise enter into heaven anything that defiles. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he's guilty of all. You shove a grand piano through a plate glass window, you've definitely broken that window pane or broken the law. But you, you shoot a BB from a BB gun through that same window, the window's still broken. You've broken the law. You've broken the window pane, if you will, if I can use that example. Either way, you've broken the law. And those who try to justify themselves by obeying the law don't succeed because you can't do it. Uh, in fact, when Jesus came to the earth, he made it even harder than it was in the Old Testament to obey all the law because he said, if you even think the thought, you're guilty of the sin. A man who lusts uh, after another man's wife has committed adultery. Whereas the Old Testament, you had to actually perform the physical act to be guilty of it. The New Testament, Jesus said, no, you, you think it, you've done it. You think it, you're guilty of it. Nobody, I don't care who you are, nobody can, can, can so channel his thoughts as to not sin against God. So you must be born again of Christ. 
and his blood covers us where we miss it and when we willfully sin and where, where we trip up and, and thank God for that mercy. But that's why you have to be born again. It's not law observance. It's the grace of God, the goodness of God. And in, and in this, God boasts of himself and not in you. And you boast in God and not in yourself. It's the gift of God. If it has to be earned, it's not a gift. So, those speak of uh, those scriptures about uh, the law, yet if anyone one point he's guilty of all. These speak of nothing entering into heaven that defiles, uh, or of the inability of the Torah, the law, to save. It does not address the command for believers to continue to abide in the faith. If you somehow manage to successfully complete all these steps and several others, said the Calvinist, there's some good news and some bad news. The only way to regain lost salvation, bad news, would be to re-crucify Christ, and that cannot be done. And then he cites uh, Hebrews chapter 6, for it's impossible for those who were once enlightened <clears throat> and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they should fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So, this Calvinist is looking at it backwards. This does speak of those who were enlightened. They tasted the heavenly gift. They were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. A partaker. They tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. It goes on to speak of them apostating and that they cannot be renewed again unto repentance, because they did re-crucify Christ, putting him to an open shame. And when you do that, you fall from God. And it's not him throwing you out. It's not him abandoning you or like you, treating you like an orphan. It's you walking away from him. When you got saved, God did not take away your free will. He did not. Oh, do you think otherwise? So, from the moment you got saved, you've been sinless? Perfect? No. Like I said, he didn't take away your free will. Calvinist, good news. If you do lose your salvation, don't worry. God won't. It's in his hand. He cites John chapter 10, I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So this states that no man, no one else, no one else, no man, nobody else, can pluck us from God's hand. It does not address the command for the individual believer to continue to abide in Christ, in the faith. The Bible tells us to do this. Abide in Christ, abide in his goodness, abide in the faith, or you'll fall away. There are so many scriptures that speak of this. Calvinist chapter, uh, uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I know in whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him in that day. Which I have committed unto him. Well, how about if, you, if you're not committing it unto him? How about if you're forsaking and walking away from it? Do you see? This speaks of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, and he's faithful. In whom I have believed. It does not address the command for believers to continue to abide in him in the faith. Calvinists, when we put our faith in Christ, we get the faith of Christ. If ours ever fails, his won't. In Galatians chapter 2, knowing that a man, this is what the Calvinist quotes me, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even if we have believed in Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. My response, this speaks of justification by faith, rather than the works of the law. 
it does not address the command for believers to continue to abide in the faith. Calvinist chapter 2 verse 2 uh, of 2 Timothy I'm sorry verse uh, chapter 2 verse 13 if we Christians believe not yet he abides faithful he cannot deny himself you left out the previous verse Mr. Calvinist let's take a look at the previous verse if we suffer we shall also reign with him if we deny him he also will deny us if we believe not yet he abides faithful he cannot deny himself you have to abide in him he's the salvation that's being offered you him Adam got us all separated from God and God says come on back to me now you want to abide with me or not I don't just receive lip service. Are you going to abide with me or not? So this ends the point counterpoint between me and this Calvinist uh, who teaches the tulip. Now I, I would like to examine some scriptures that speak of the necessity of believers to remain faithful and of many warnings given to those who apostated, who fell from the faith. Uh, the common theme throughout the scripture is the necessity of continuing in the faith. We'll start with Genesis chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, who had killed his brother Abel, Why are you furious, and why are you downcast? If you do right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not right, sin is crouching at the door, like a, like a lion or a tiger crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now there's something that God gave him to do. You have to master the sin nature that's in you. You have to get mastery over it. And the Lord said, I'll hide my face from them, and I'll see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. You know, the New Testament says the just shall live by faith, but here it is in the, in the Old Testament, way back in Deuteronomy. What does God say to people who are not operating in faith? That they're a very forward generation. I'll hide my face from them. They're very forward like in your face forward. Not a good thing. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk, chapter 2. God says, you'll live by faith. You're justified by faith. Nobody's getting into God's house because they obeyed a series of laws, do's and don'ts. You have to have faith in God. If you don't, you're not getting into his house. John 15, I'm the true vine, said Jesus, and my father's the husbandman. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So every branch that's in Christ, now Christ is the vine, the true vine, and he's got all these branches attached to him, and he's feeding them. But every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does the father do? He's the husbandman. He's going through the garden and he's trimming and he's plucking and what does he do? He takes it away. If the branch doesn't bear fruit, what does the father do? He takes it away. Break the branch off. Every branch that, that bears fruit, he purges it. Trim it back a little bit, it bears more fruit. For those of you who understand gardening, uh, that it might bring forth more fruit. Trim off the little dead parts and let the living part continue to grow. You're purging it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you, said Jesus, and abide in me and I in you. We have to abide in him. We have to. If you don't, don't expect to be with him in the next life. It's insanity to think you're going to be with him in the next life if you're not abiding with him in this life. It's That's just insane. Uh, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you bear fruit, except you abide in me. The branches, the fruit's hanging off the branches, but it's the vine feeding the branches. The 
spiritual life runs up through the vine and supports the branches. I'm the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. If you're abiding in him and he's abiding in you. Without me, you can do nothing. Well, without him, you're not getting into heaven. Without him, you're, the Father is not performing his works. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. What happens if you're not abiding in him? You're cast forth. What? From who? From Christ. He breaks it off. What happens when you break off a branch and throw it away? It withers up. And here, angels, referred to as men, they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they're burned. A worthless branch, an apostate, someone who fell away. The Father wants to reveal himself. He wants to reveal his goodness and mercies. He wants to reveal his works. He wants to reveal his works in and through us by Christ Jesus. And if your body in Christ, this energy flow comes into you. You're born of Christ, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And that starts flowing out of you. And that starts changing you. And it starts changing your environment. And as you witness to others, it changes them too. If you try to do works separate from God and come to him on the last and say, look at all the things we did in your name, it's nothing. The Bible says all of our works are as filthy rags. First Timothy chapter 1, holding faith and a good conscience. Holding faith, keeping in the faith, and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Well, you had to have the good faith. You're in the ship. You've got the good faith, so it's the good ship faith. Okay, here we go. We're in the water. And then what happened? Shipwreck. <laughs> Why? They put away their faith. Abide in the faith. Abide in Christ. Abide in his goodness. And if you don't, you make shipwreck. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. So you have to be in the faith to depart from the faith. They'll depart. They go away to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're led astray by all kinds of uh, cult and occult doctrines and all kinds of things. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. How do we live? By faith. What happens if we don't live by faith? Shipwreck. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The Lord speaking here. Romans chapter 3, and not rather as we slanderously be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. Hey, this grace is being offered to us. Let's just go out and party as hard as we can and do every sin we can think of because, hey, the grace is there. We'll just take the grace. No, if that's your mindset, your damnation is just. That's not what salvation is about. How much can I get away with and still get into heaven? That's not what salvation is about. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. See that? Romans chapter 8, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, carnality, uh, works of the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So it's saying, be led of the Spirit of God. Look, you've got basically five gates, if you will. Uh, see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. And whatever you're seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, or smelling, if you put that in front of you, it's going to get into your head. The Bible calls those things imaginings, imaginings, and into your heart. And those things are uh, strongholds. They're called strongholds. 
And if those things get in your head and your heart that are that are of the flesh or of carnality or demonic, uh, now you got to go get them cast out of you. And that can it's a lot easier to let the devil into your house than it is to get them out. Everyone dies physically. The above scripture is not speaking of physical death. It's speaking of spiritual death. How do I know that? Let's read it again. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if we live after the flesh, you shall die. That would imply that if, uh, if you, through the Spirit, do put to death the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Okay? Live, uh, live eternally forever. Eternal life. Uh, Jesus said, and this is eternal life, to know the one true God and to believe on him whom he has sent. So someone said, how can Jesus be God? Yeah, he's God. He's the eternal word of God himself, God. So if you want to declare something of yourself, you being created in God's image and likeness, you'll speak it. If God wants to declare something of himself, he speaks it. He speaks to the angels, speaks to the devils, he speaks to human beings, he speaks to whatever part of creation he wants to speak to, to declare something. He speaks it, he says it, and he gives it to us to do the same thing, to speak it out of our mouths, to declare things. That's why we are to declare, to abide, to meditate, to speak the word of God out of our mouths, because that word gets hidden in your heart. Uh, Jesus said that the, the tongues, the, the, the book of James, the tongue's the smallest of, of, of our members, but it's set on fire of hell. Where's that fire of hell coming from? Well, Jesus said that uh, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. From the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. He said, then you speak evil. Uh, speaking of uh, referring to that particular group, uh, twice, twice in scriptures, Jesus talks about speaking your word from your heart. And if your tongue is set on fire of hell, the Bible says, no man can tame it, can tame it. So that's separate from God. But if you're in Christ, you can get victory over your tongue. How do I know? The Bible says that a, a man who can, can rule over his, the words of his mouth, that his religion is pure. <coughs> so there is victory there. Uh, apply yourself. Get there. Stay there. Abide in the Spirit of God. John chapter 1 says that Jesus comes from the bosom of the Father, the heart of the Father. He's the Word of God. It says that the Word of God himself, God, John chapter 1. God's Word comes from the heart of God, out of the mouth of God. Your Word comes from your heart and out of your mouth. So if you're led of the Spirit of God, then you've got the victory. But if you're led of the carnality, when, when Adam sinned against God in the Garden of Eden, uh, his mind took ascendancy over his spirit. You've got three onboard computers. You've got the area between your ears. We can call that your mind or your soul. Your emotions and your logic and your feelings. That stuff that happens there. And that's what Adam listened to. And that's also what Eve listened to. It says that she reasoned these things. That, the, that eating this fruit would be good. She reasoned it. That was her mind. But out of the Spirit of God, out of their bellies, the Bible says, flow rivers of living water. That's your spirit. If she'd been spirit-led, she'd have put away that thought in her mind, and, and there'd have been a whole different kind of creation we're in. She didn't. But who's going to rule your heart? Because if you're spirit-led, your heart's filled with the, with the Word of God. And if you're carnally led, then all these see, hear, taste, touch, and smell stuff that's, that you shouldn't have in front of you to begin with, winds up going into your head and becoming imaginings and then down into your heart and becoming strongholds. There's the fight. There's the warfare. So everyone dies physically, but this scripture is speaking of spiritual death. Spiritual death. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward you, goodness, if, 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 if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall also be cut off. And don't be afraid. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, 
the Bible says, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Perfect love or love perfected cast out all fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. Just make up your mind you're going to abide in Christ, and there's nothing in heaven, earth, or hell that can separate you from him if you'll do that and, and just follow through with it. Meditate in the scriptures. Speak the scriptures. Worship and praise God. Give them thanks. The Bible says the wrath of God in the book of Romans, the wrath of God abides on the unthankful man. Give them thanks. You don't have to worry about the wrath of God in that wise. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, examine or test yourselves whether you be in the faith. This is to Christians. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Test yourselves or examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Are you in the faith? Prove it your own self. Uh, or do you not know this of yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you be a reprobate, unless you fail the test? That's the test, folks. That's the test. Now, God's letting you be born of the Spirit, but he didn't take your will away from you, and you're going to have to decide on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm going to walk with Jesus, or I'm not going to walk with Jesus, and that's your decision, not God's decision. See, people make their own decisions, but God judges those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, Paul said, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. It must be possible to be a castaway, else why did Paul, who wrote half the books of the New Testament, speak of the possibility of it? Why mention such a thing if it's not possible? Someone says, well, if you were never saved, you could be a castaway. That's not what he's saying here. Lest that by any means, after I have preached the gospel to others, I myself should be a castaway. I keep my body under. I keep it into subjection. So I'm not out sinning. 2 Peter chapter 3, you therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things before, beware. Now here's a warning. This is to the beloved. This is to the body of Christ. Beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. What happens when you fall? You go down to the ground. He's warning them. You can fall with the wicked, with the error of the wicked. You can fall. Abide in Christ. He's more than enough. His grace is more than sufficient. Romans chapter 6, do you not know that whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? This is written to Christians. Romans chapter 6. If you obey sin, it leads to death. If you obey God and walk in his faith, this obedience leads to righteousness. The Bible says that uh, Christ has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now look in the order that that's written. Wisdom, the word of God comes to you. Wisdom, there's wisdom. The next step is righteousness. As that wisdom takes effect, it takes root in you and gets settled, you get settled in that wisdom, then that righteousness of God begins manifesting. And the, the next step is sanctification. God sets you apart separately for his own use. Sanctification, which leads to what? Redemption. The Bible says, look up, your redemption draws near when you see these things happening. I'm seeing these things happening. The Bible speaks of the end times. These things happening. The principle of the male and the female, that when Jesus hung on the cross, his side was pierced with a spear. After he had died, his side was pierced with a spear, and then blood and water came out of his side. This was the birth of his bride, the female, the bride of Christ. When Adam was put to sleep in the garden, God brought from a substance of his side, it didn't actually say rib, just from his side, uh, the female. This was a, a, a type or shadow of Christ being, being put to sleep or crucified on the cross. 
we look in the Old Testament and it speaks of wisdom. It says, I, wisdom, was with God from the beginning. Uh, and, and she speaks of herself, wisdom, in the feminine gender. And then when we look in the New Testament, it says that God, uh, in, in, uh, that in Christ is hidden, is hidden all the wisdom of God. In Christ, masculine gender, is hidden all the wisdom, feminine gender of God. So, What's, who's in, who, what is in Christ? This wisdom of God. And when you abide in Christ and ask God, let this wisdom manifest in me, and it will come to you. God will manifest his wisdom. He's going to point you right to the scriptures and say, meditate in my word. So everyone physically dies. Romans 6.16 is not speaking of physical death here. It's speaking of spiritual death. Belief unto righteousness, obedience unto righteousness. First Thessalonians chapter 1, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. Why bother to pray for the person if it's an already done deal? Because you can fall away. And we are in part responsible for each other's salvation. You need to pray for other people. You need to pray for your family. You need to pray for the people that have wronged you and for the people that you've wronged. Romans chapter 8, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, things present or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What's the one thing you don't see in that list? Yourself. It doesn't say that I am persuaded that I cannot separate myself from God. It says I'm persuaded that nothing else can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You can choose to walk away. You've still got will. You can still make choices. Do you still sin? Well, that's your will. It's not Christ telling you to sin. Hebrews chapter 1. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Future tense. The scriptures say who endures to the end shall be saved. That's what the scripture says. He who endures to the end shall be saved. We're betrothed to Christ. And we're waiting to become the bride of Christ. We're like engaged. Okay, we're engaged. And uh, Christ is coming back for a, a, for a bride who's spotless. Now, don't worry about how fast or slow you are compared to others. The Bible says don't compare yourself to others. But if you're living like a pig in a trough, I would say you better take a hard look at whether you know Christ. Uh, and you better get serious with him. And you better get on your face before him and ask him to deliver you out of this stuff, whatever you're in. There's only one forgivable, uh, one unforgivable sin. Uh, the Bible says there is only one unforgivable sin. Jesus said, all manner of sin will be forgiven those uh, who blaspheme uh, the Son. Uh, but the one unforgivable sin is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that sin shall not be forgiven, not in this life and not in kingdom come. That sin shall not be forgiven. Well, how do you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Do you call them names like a kid on the schoolyard? No. No. That's not what he's talking about, blaspheming of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is also referred to in Scripture and is the Spirit of Truth. And if you speak of the Spirit of... If you reject, if you reject the offer of the Spirit of Truth to be saved, if you reject the witness of the Holy Spirit calling you and tugging at you and saying, look, you're lost, you're dead in your sin, you're going to be separated eternally from me if you don't put your trust in my Christ. If you reject that offer, there's nothing left but darkness. Nothing. 
reject the light, there's nothing left but darkness. That's why the scripture says concerning the Antichrist showing up that uh, God turns these people over to this darkness that God does, that they might be damned, that God might damn them. Why? The Bible says why. Well, it answers the same question. Just keep reading. It's right there. Because they rejected the love of the truth. You reject the light, there's only darkness. How many times does God have to call you? How stubborn is your heart? For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they should fall away to renew them again to repentance. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame for the earth that drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and brings forth herbs meat are acceptable for them by whom it is dressed receives blessing from God but that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is near unto cursing whose end is to be burned these people referred to here they were enlightened they tasted the heavenly gift they were made partakers of the Holy Spirit they tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come then they fell away and their end is to be burned for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold, if we hold, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast. Well, what happens if you don't hold the beginning of your confidence steadfast? Then you're not a partaker of Christ anymore. All it is said today, if we shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke God. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? Whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he that should not rest, did he swear that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. You want to enter into God's rest in Christ? You have to believe. You have to abide in faith. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You can also fall away because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 10, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The pure water of the word. Uh, let us hold fast the profession that word profession also translates the same word from the Greek confession. To confess or to profess something, the confession of our faith, let us hold fast without wavering. Without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. Now are you going to do your part and be faithful to abide in him? And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as some manner of some is some people stop going to church uh, but the Bible says that we are to come together we are assembling uh, before the word church came into being the, the word was the assembly we are to assemble ourselves together corporately together to worship God there's a lot more strength in corporate worship than there is in singular worship and uh, we are supposed to look after each other's needs in prayer and ministering to each other, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, to exhort, to encourage each other. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking of, for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment do you suppose shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant whereth he was uh, sanctified an unholy thing? This was written specifically, book of Hebrews, to Jews by Paul. 
and he's saying that some of these people came to Christ, but then they're saying, uh, he said, the, the, your forefathers that despised the law that Moses gave, they were killed. They're literally out in the wilderness. They were bitten by snakes. They were devoured. The ground opened up and swallowed them, uh, which shall devour the adversaries. It says Moses died without, with, uh, uh, he, just, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment, worse punishment, do you suppose he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. You see, you were sanctified in the blood. You were sanctified. But now, because these Jews have come at you, this is what Paul was saying to these people, and they're saying you have to deny Christ, you have to apostate, you have to come back to us, and they would, and they would even count the blood of Jesus Christ an unholy thing. An unholy thing and has done despite the spirit of grace. So you're denying the spirit of God saying to you, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're you're damning yourself. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, I'll repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You fall into the hands of the living God without without an intercessor. Jesus being the intercessor, your advocate, your lawyer, uh, your high priest, if he's not between you and the Father, you don't have any hope. Paul was addressing the terrible apostasy of some Jews who under pressure from family turned back to the Old Testament Judaism and counted the blood of the covenant where they were sanctified, an unholy thing. Is it possible to fall away? Yes, it is. Here's an example right here. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. 2 Peter 2, verse 15, which have forsaken the right way. So they were on the right way. They were on the right path, but they forsook it. They were going the right way, but they forsook it. And they're gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, in whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts, the desires of the flesh, uh, through much wantonness, those who were, were clean, uh, escaped them who live in error, escaped from them who lived in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if after they had escaped the pollutions of the world, now here it says they escaped the pollutions of the world, that's the Holy Spirit's work, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through that knowledge, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, operating in him, then again entangled therein, and overcome, and their latter end is worse than with them than at the beginning. For it had been better for them had they not known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But as it happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dogs returned to his own vomit, and the pig as that was washed has gone back to wallowing in the dung, the mire. You can't forsake the right way unless you're going the right way. They were sanctified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had escaped the pollutions of the world through the personal relationship, knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they fell away. John 3.16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believe on him, believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Perish here is referring to spiritual death, not physical death. Everybody physically dies. The requirement is that one believes. If you fall from the faith, you cease to believe. Don't be deceived. The Bible says God is not mocked. You're not going to mock God. It's not going to happen. What a man sows, what he plants, is what he reaps, is what he harvests. What you plant is what you're going to harvest, for good or for bad. 
Some of you need to pray for crop failures, some of the things you've been planting. Let's take a look at John chapter 15. Jesus said, I'm the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. He tends the garden. Uh, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. And the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine. If you're not abiding in Christ, you're not bearing fruit. Not the fruit of, of God manifesting his works in you and through you. And no more can you, except you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth from a branch, cast from me, and he withers up. You, you break a branch off a tree and throw it, throw it down, what happens? It withers up. Why? Because it's not being fed anymore. And men gather them, and the angels come, and they gather in the fire, and they throw, throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. It shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified. Why is he glorified? Because it's his works being done in you and through you. He gets the glory for every single part of your salvation. Uh, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Because iniquity shall abound, it says, the love of many shall wax cold. Well, it wasn't cold, but it became cold. What became cold? The love that was in your heart. Your heart becomes cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same, the same shall be saved. Endure to the end? Yes. Endure to the end. He that endures to the end. Have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the sake of the word. Immediately they are offended. Affliction, persecution, causes some to fall away. The parable of the sower, found in a couple of Gospels, and in Mark chapter 4, when Jesus uh, speaks the parable, there's a whole lot of people standing around him listening to what he has to say, and most of them just walk off. Like, oh, that was an interesting story. And they leave. Didn't make any sense to them. They didn't bother to come to Jesus and say, would you explain this to us? We didn't get it. We heard what you said, but we didn't understand it. And to those that did come to him, he said, it's given to you to understand, to know. But to these others, it's just a parable. They heard it and they walked off. You read something you don't understand the Bible, don't condemn the Bible. Don't condemn God. Go to God and say, show me what this means. Because I love you. I know your word is truth. Explain it to me. And he will. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The parable of the sower, beginning of Mark, Mark chapter 4, uh, Jesus said that Satan comes for the sake of the word. For the sake of the word. God speaks his word to create creation and to uphold creation, to guide it and to propel it. God saves his creation by his word. The word became flesh. The word of God himself, God. The word of truth. The word of life. The everlasting life that was with the Father. These are scriptures. It's the word that became flesh. God sent his word to declare himself. You want to declare yourself, you send your word and say you must believe on the one true God. And you have to believe uh, on the one that, uh, whom he has sent. Why? Because Jesus is saying, I'm his word, and if you don't hear me, you don't hear him. And if you don't know me, you don't know him. And if you don't know me, you don't have eternal life, because no man comes to the Father but by me. I'm his word. He sent me to declare himself. Satan doesn't want that to happen, so he tries to block the word. And it goes on to say in the parable of the sower a second time that for the word's sake, Satan comes, uh, I like the, the Amplified translation, violently and by force. Satan comes violently, immediately, violently, and by force to stop the word from going forth. 
Jesus said, Father, your will be done, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Satan says, no, that doesn't work for me. I don't want your word into the earth. If you get your word into the earth, it's going to become like it is in heaven. So he comes to stop it. He that endures to thee and the same, the same shall be saved. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is taken by force and the violent man, the violent man enters therein. The kingdom of God is taken by force and the violent man enters therein. But the Bible says of Satan that Satan's violent and he uses force to oppose. You've got two opposing each other. And, and God is saying it's through force and violence that you take the kingdom. And Satan is using force and violence to stop you. It's not Sunday picnic on the ground past the fried chicken. Get that out of your head. That's not what this is about. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that shall be tried, and you shall be uh, have tribulation ten days. Uh, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Be faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which you have, that let no man take your crown. Well, if it wasn't possible for someone to take your crown, why would he say hang on to it? Because someone's going to try to take it. Hold fast that which you have, let no man take your crown. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, or Revelation chapter 2, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you have left your first love. Who's the first love spoken of here? It's Jesus. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, repent, and do your first works. He's saying, come back to me. You've strayed off. He's calling them back. He doesn't say, oh, you slipped, you fell into hell with you. No, he's saying, look, you're going the wrong way. Repent. Where repent means to turn around. Come back to me, he's saying, or else, or else, if you don't, I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of his place. Cast you into hell, except you repent. If you don't repent, I'll remove the light from you. What does a candlestick do? It produces light. I'll remove the light from you. What's left over? Darkness. Unless you repent. Can you feel the grace of God? Hebrews 12, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. Well, apparently you can, because it says right here, lest any man fail the grace of God. We look diligently, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, whereby many be defiled. Bitterness can defile you, the root of bitterness. Lest there be any fornicator, profane person, as he saw, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully and with tears. If there's any desire in you to come to God, that's God calling you. So say, oh, I'm lost. It's all over with now. Uh, if there's any desire in you to come to God, that's his grace working with you. So don't fear that you, you've lost your soul. If there's any desire in you to come to him, that's him. He's saying, come to me. Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is written to Christians in Galatians chapter 5. He's warning them. He's giving warnings to them. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, the permanent separation from God. The unbelieving shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I want you to notice something here. All these horrible people spoken of doing all these horrible things. What's at the top of God's list? Cowards. The fearful. The coward. God hates a coward. You can take that to the bank. God hates a coward. 
Fear contradicts faith. It works totally against faith. So the fearful is at the top of God's list to be cast to the lake of fire. The Bible says we're not given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You got a problem with fear, you meditate on that scripture and you rebuke the spirit of fear. How do I know fear is a spirit? Because God said we're not given the spirit of fear. Fear, you're a spirit, I rebuke you. Be gone from me. I stand against you in the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm not, God isn't giving you to me. I'm, I'm not giving you as a spirit. I'm giving the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Perfected love or, or perfect love casts you out. That's the way you talk to it. Talk to it. Just like that. Jesus talked to the wind, the waves, the sea. He talked to a fig tree. He talked to all kinds of things. Inanimate objects. And they obeyed him. Christ in me, my hope of glory. Now you do it. Revelation 21, there shall in no wise enter in anything that defiles uh, whatsoever, that, neither whatsoever that works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You've got to get this defilement out of you. You come to Jesus. Jesus, I'm, I'm a sinful person. I, I, I might be setting sins that I continually I am, uh, the, the, are in front of me, and uh, I need your help to put them out. He's going to tell you to meditate in his word, to speak his word, to don't stop speaking his word, but to keep it going forth from your mouth. Just like he did to Joshua after Moses had died, and God uh, preached uh, Moses' uh, eulogy, very simple eulogy. Moses, my servant, is dead. That was that. And he said to Joshua, now you're in charge of this two to three million uh, souls, Jews. Now you're in charge. And uh, don't be afraid. Uh, fear not. Don't be afraid. 144 times the Old Testament. The Bible says, fear not. 144 times. That's a significant number, which I won't get into right now. But the point being, God says, don't be afraid. Fear contradicts faith. They don't work with each other. They contradict. They're enemies. There's enmity. They contradict. So put fear away from you. And he said, God said to Moses to meditate in his word day and night. Now the only word they had back then was the law, but that's the word that he was to meditate in. It's the only word he was given. The Psalms and the prophets weren't written yet, or the Proverbs. None of that was written yet. These people hadn't even come to being yet. This is way, way, way back early in the, in the scriptures. He said, meditate my word day and night and don't stop speaking it. The word meditate, it's like a cow that has three stomachs and, and it chews the cud, the grass, and they regurgitates it and it goes to the second area and then regurgitates it and it goes to the third area. Uh, and uh, then basically you know, the milk is produced. The milk Meditate in his word day and night. Don't stop speaking his word. Keep his word going forth. And then God said, you'll have good success. Then everything that you set your hand to shall prosper. Oh, someone said that's Old Testament. So, all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes and amen. Well, maybe those, maybe those promises are just New Testament. No, they're Old Testament too. How do I know? Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Old Testament law, being made cursed for us, for it's written, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. That the blessings that God gave to Abraham, hey folks, that's Old Testament, the blessings that God gave to Abraham would come to us. We're free of the curses and we're given the blessings. Old Testament included. If any man takes away from the Words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. God shall take away his part. Can't lose your salvation? That sure looks like it. He, he strikes your name from the book of life. Your name's not in that book. The Bible says that uh, when hell and death uh, and, and the ocean and everything, all these parts where people had died, when they all give up their souls, uh, the, at that time, um, hell and death is in, are emptied out. Every, everything is standing before God. It says, if your name's not in the book of life, 
that you're cast into the lake of fire. Your name has to be in this book, folks. It has to be in this book. If it's not, God's not mocked. And he's true to himself, and he's true to what he said. If your name's not in that book, you're not going to get into his house. Romans chapter 13, whoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. 2 Corinthians 2, if we suffer, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Can Christ deny you? Yes. And he says so, right here. He'll deny you. Walk away from him, he'll walk away from you. And he'll tell you that was your choice and you did it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their worm will eat as does a canker worm, like a cancer, of whom Hymonius and uh, Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is already past and overthrow the faith of some. You can have your faith overthrown. Let no man take your crown. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful what you listen to. Guard your heart with all diligence, the Bible says. He that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Purged is in delivered from, cleansed from. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Don't be like one of these that's uh, blind and can't see far off and has forgotten that he at one time had been cleansed of all these old sins. Don't go back into it. And if you do, come to Jesus. Is there any desire in you to get right with God? That's God calling you. Don't wait. I can't guarantee you another moment in this earth. If you're in that kind of a backslidden state, come to God. Get right with Him. Get serious with Him. Uh, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his flavor, if you will, savor or flavor, so you're the salt of the earth, but it says that you can lose your flavor. You can lose your saltiness. Uh, wherewith shall you be salted? If henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out. You can be walking with the Lord. You can be the salt of the earth. But if you lose that salt, you are cast out and trodden under foot of men. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Spit you out. Don't be lukewarm. Get on fire for the Lord. Now, this is making reference to food. Some food tastes good cold, some food tastes good hot, but lukewarm doesn't, doesn't have that much flavor. Food that doesn't have salt on it doesn't have much flavor. He's just using examples here. Uh, from the, that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were his disciples. This is in John chapter 6, verse 66. Interesting verse address there. John 6, 6, 6. Uh, there were a lot, there were more than 12 people that walked with them, folks. A lot of people walked with them. A lot of them. The Bible in one place talks about the 72 that he sent out. But this was like huge multitudes of people, and many of them were his disciples. Disciplined ones. The word disciple, a disciplined individual. But when they heard him say that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there's no life in you, they said, it's a hard saying. We can't hear it. And then they walked off. <clears throat> they left. Why didn't they come to Jesus and say, would you explain this to us? The, the, uh, the 12 did. They said, this is a hard saying. You can hear it. And he said, look, the flesh doesn't profit you anything. Eat my flesh and drink my blood or there's no life in you. And then he says, the flesh doesn't profit you anything. It's the spirit that gives life. You see, the, through the spirit, he gave this sacrifice of his body. His body broken. Uh, the, the veil rent, torn in half, that we could go inside the Holy of Holies into the temple to stand before God and have peace with the Father God and just and have peace with Him. His blood shed for the remission of our sins. Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sin. 
That's the sacrifice. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Grant us peace. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. The word of falling away means uh, the apostasy. And it speaks about that day shall not come, the end. Uh, there's first the apostasy and the man of sin. Uh, the Antichrist is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped. So that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This beast is going to go into the temple, falsely declaring himself to be God. Let no man deceive you. That day shall not come except there come the apostasy. Meaning, a lot of people that were with Christ fall away from Christ. Why? Their hearts grow waxy, grow cold. Why? Because of the things happening in the world. And the Bible says many men's hearts will fail them. Uh, many will be afraid. Many will grow cold. Their love will dry up because they did not abide in the faith. Christ in you is by faith. Fall from the faith and Christ is not in you. Hence the apostasy. I finish my teaching with this prayer. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, said Jesus. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and I'll eat with him and he with me and to him that overcomes I will grant to sit with me on my throne even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father on his throne Revelation 3 verse 20 21 Lord God you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son that believing in him I shall not die in my sin but have everlasting life I know you don't want me to die in my sin so you're calling me to repentance. Therefore, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, cleanses me from all sin and gives me eternal life, everlasting life. Uh, Lord Jesus, I now accept you as my Savior and my Lord, and I ask you to give me the Holy Spirit and to teach me to love, obey, and please you. Satan, I renounce you in all of your works, and I command you to depart in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that I am now given everlasting life and have become a son of God. I praise your holy name. Glory to you, Father God, and to you, Jesus, Son of God Most High, and to the Holy Spirit God. Glory. Amen.